Charles Stephen, I, I had asked him uh, if he could provide, I, I mean, to, in his defense, it was just earlier this morning, I asked him if he could provide a CV so that I could introduce him more properly. He said, heck, I know where that is. So I finally found it, though. I found it on the Antiochian Archdiocese website. You can always leave it to the Antiochians to make sure to provide it for <clears throat> So without further ado, I do want to introduce our, our speaker this morning. Uh, Father Stephen was born in Greenville, South Carolina in 1953 and educated in the local schools there. He graduated from Furman University in 1977 with a BA in Classical Languages. He received his Master of Divinity at Seabury Western Theological Seminary in 1980 and an MA in Religion from Duke University in 1991. He was ordained in the ministry of the Episcopal Church in 1980 and served parishes, these are Anglican Episcopal parishes, in Columbia, South Carolina, Simpsonville, South Carolina, Anderson, South Carolina, Durham, North Carolina, and Oak Ridge, Tennessee. In February of 1998, Father Stephen converted to Orthodoxy along with his wife and children. He was ordained to the priesthood in the Orthodox Church in March of 1999 and served as the rector of St. Anne Orthodox Church in Oak Ridge since that time, since the time of his retirement in 2019. 2020. In 2020, early 2020. <clears throat> he is the author of numerous articles on theology and modern culture. His books include Shaping Our Future, which was printed in 19, published in 1994, uh, Everywhere Present, Christianity in a One-Story Universe in 2011, and of course his most recent uh, book, which we have copies of in the back, um, uh, Face to Face, I'm trying to remember the title off the top of my head, Face to Face, Knowing God Beyond Knowing Our God Shame, Beyond Our Shame, published just earlier this year. Correct? March, yep. Yes. Very good. Uh, and of course, we also may know him through his very popular uh, blog site, Glory to God for All Things, and his uh, podcast of the same name. Father Stephen has served as the Dean of the Appalachian Deanery in the Diocese of the South within the Orthodox Church in America from 2003 to 2011, and has been very active in assisting with the foundation of mission churches across the Appalachian region. In 2010, he was elevated to the rank of Archpriest. Uh, he has uh, four children, and uh, if, I'm, if I'm counting correctly, you have four or five grandchildren? Five now. Five grandchildren. Yeah. Glory to God. Amen. Amen. Uh, now, this is the last part, so you're going to have to tell me how accurate this is. Okay. okay? Uh -oh. It says, when asked what early Christian Father Stephen would most like to be, he replied, one who was not martyred. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like me. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, then, and then he goes on, on to offer St. John the Theologian. He liked St. John the Theologian because he came closest to experiencing and understanding the mystical presence of God in his love and mercy, yep. which is a beautiful answer. And he did not die a martyr. And so. he did not die a martyr. So <laughs> Though they boiled him in an oil before that. So, so we, again, yeah. uh, here at our parish, we're so very, very grateful to have uh, with us. And I personally am grateful to have a longtime friend and confidant and guide in the Orthodox faith. So I will introduce to all of you Father Stephen Freeman. Thank you. Good. Good. So we'll... It is very good to be here. It's good. I was going to say, uh, I don't think I've really mentioned this story much before, but um, the first Episcopal priest I met on his road to Orthodoxy was Father Gregory, Father Stephen's father whom you all know here well, since he's retired to this area. Uh, we had a mutual friend up in the Maryland area. Uh, I was attending a conference in Baltimore, and this friend said, I have someone you, you will want to meet, and introduced me to Father Gregory. It was like two weeks before you guys were being received in uh, to Orthodoxy. And I was intrigued, first off, because I'd had a long love affair with Orthodoxy, and uh, but I hadn't, you know, kind of, dealt with it from, so this was like the first person I'd met who was making this journey that I was interested in, and I was asking him, how are you doing it, and he's telling me some things, then we had to bustle off to hear some theologians at this conference, but uh, that was my first encounter with Father Gregory. Later, um, at Holy Cross uh, up in Linthicum, uh, I had a parishioner of mine marry a parishioner of his, and literally my first wedding as an Orthodox priest, I assisted Father Gregory, which was great because it gave me a chance to watch how it's done. Um, 
I, I, Father Gregory had better preparation when he converted. I, uh, I finished my, said my last sermon, said my last mass as an Episcopal priest on February 8 of 98. A week later, February 15, I was chrismated, uh, well, along with my family in Columbia, South Carolina, uh, in a church that was uh, converted from a pizza parlor, typical Southern, you know, mission kind of work. Uh, the priest was from Brooklyn and sounded like Bugs Bunny. And uh, it was all my kind of initiation into to, uh, you know, Southern Orthodoxy. And, uh, but I was uh, chrismated and immediately uh, by uh, Archbishop Dimitri, immediately appointed to start the mission in Knoxville. So my learning curve in Orthodoxy was vertical. Uh, and I, I was, a, what, until, you know, the next year that I was priested, uh, and it, you know, I know you'd had uh, some uh, classes to cut or some, some studies to prepare you uh, before you converted, yeah? Yeah, well, I had, I had a year of uh, uh, it was extension. That, yeah. You know, that sort of thing. Yeah. Well, they didn't really start mine until after I converted, and so I was having to, I had a job working as a hospice chaplain, and so I was burying three people a week and, uh, and trying to study at night. You know, with various things and the thing the silly thing was is as the OCA was doing this they were giving you I was having to write sort of graduate level papers on theology well I could have taught the course on theology I mean that had been my background what I needed was just hardcore Eastern liturgical training so I was glad to go up and assist Father Gregory at this wedding the bride fainted in the middle of the wedding she was actually a marine officer but she fainted in the wedding uh, <laughs> And I was impressed by his pastoral skills, like, how do you handle a fainting bride, you know, and it, it, it is very good. So that's not in the book anywhere. You really just have to make it up as you go. Well, it's good to be here. Uh, last week I was in Dayton, Ohio, and uh, this is a shorter drive, so it's, it's good to be here. Um, and, uh, you know, it's interesting to me, as a convert to Orthodoxy, I always... Uh, as I jokingly told someone, because I was a convert to the Episcopal Church, uh, converted, I was raised a culture Baptist in South Carolina. Uh, that's not an official denomination, that's just a birth status in that state. Um, but I converted when I was a teenager into the Episcopal Church and then spent 20 years as an Episcopal priest, which I describe as spending 20 years trying to pass for white. And uh, that, Father Gregory, you were cradle, weren't you? Uh, cradle what? Episcopalian? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, from Charleston? Yeah. And then, and then I mean, that's like, that's, that, that's the holy city in South that's Carolina. Yeah. yeah. So, so you were, you were kind of to the manner born. It's not exactly the New Jerusalem, but it's the old Jerusalem. Yeah, that's right. It's where the Ashley and Cooper Rivers come together to form the Atlantic Ocean. That's the, yeah. So they say the Charlestonians are like the Chinese. They eat a lot of rice, they speak a foreign language, and they worship their ancestors. So anyway, but it's good to be here. I, I, I grew up in Greenville, uh, which is not unlike here, foot, foothills, Piedmont of the mountains. Uh, but I remember as a child these long, hot, lazy days. Uh, back, back before we had climate change, we had seasons. And, uh, but I mean, the my childhood summers in upstate South Carolina, we'd get booted out of the house in the morning uh, at some point. Uh, certainly, you know, once the morning cartoons were off, which is about nine o'clock when they did those shows had disappeared, uh, we'd get kicked out of the house. Uh, you, if you wanted water, there was a garden hose. You could do that. So. Uh, that was how it was, and, uh, and the expectation is that you would stay out of trouble. As in, if mama has to come out and take care of something, you are in trouble. But one of the very powerful memories I have from my childhood that still lingers with me is boredom. Those long, hot summer days. I mean, you had enough toys uh, and had plenty of imaginations, but there were days just laying around with your friends in the backyard as the sun beat down on you and it's 104 degrees in the shade. And uh, the conversation would sort of boil down to, well, what do you want to do? I don't know. What do you want to do? 
And uh, that, that's what, those, are, those are the hard days when you've got to reach that. What do you want to, I don't know, what do you want to do? It's oftentimes that was a prelude to getting in trouble. But, uh, you know, uh, you, you could go gather uh, uh, Coke bottles out of the ditches in the neighborhood. They didn't do this in Charleston, but you could get Coke bottles, two cents a piece. You get a dozen Coke bottles or so, and you got twenty. You could you could shop with a dot with with a quarter, and uh, you could also you could buy a pack of uh, firecrackers for ten cents, without any parental permission down at the corner of grocery. So if you got really bored, you know, let's go get some Coke bottles and blow things up. But those boredoms. What do you do? I don't know. What do you want to do? As adults, uh, we sometimes still have a similar experience. You, you look in a closet, you know, your clo closet in your bedroom, and you have this feeling, I have nothing to wear. I've heard that before. <laughs> that usually means shopping's coming on, but uh, I have nothing to wear. was basically meaning that nothing that I have in my closet interests me today. I mean, that just happens. Or perhaps even more commonly, oh, you get this, I'm retired now with my wife. What do you want for supper? I don't know. What do you want? Uh, and that conversation starts going on. And you hit the fast season, and it's even worse, because there's only like, I mean, how many times a day can you eat peanut butter and jelly? And uh, no, I had that for lunch. So. This inner mood uh, of boredom is no stranger to any of us, whether you're a child or a retired person or whatever else, and in, in the most common kinds of places. Um, and it's very much a description of an inner mood, uh, not a description of what's going on outside you. I mean, the toys for a child are no different today than they were yesterday when they seemed interesting, but today, I can't think of anything to play with. My closet's no different today than it was yesterday, but today I have nothing to wear. Uh, the contents of my pantry and refrigerator can be the same from day to day, but today I can't think of anything to eat. And uh, I mean, what changes uh, is, I mean, what is variable from day to day is our mood. Uh, it's the interior life that plagues us. So this talk, uh, if you read the little blurb or stuff from the church, uh, it's going to be about coldness of heart and the perception of God. And this coldness of heart, I'm kind of approaching it first off from this experience of boredom. You may not have noticed when you couldn't think of anything to wear, but you're experiencing coldness of heart as you stare into your closet and all those clothes you have. Um, I read a book a few uh, years ago called The Empire of Things. And uh, it was, I love drilling down in history. I mean, the more boring the detail is, the more I like it. And this was a sort of a history of the acquisition of stuff in, in Western Europe. I mean, going from, you know, owning a tunic, maybe, maybe two tunics if you've got, you know, a bit of money uh, in the Roman Empire uh, versus... Uh, once we start getting towards late Middle Ages, Renaissance, people begin to have, a, there's a little more wealth. Oddly enough, the big event was when a half of Europe died from the Black Plague. Uh, wages went up after that, strangely enough. I mean, if less competition, you can, you know, get paid more. People had a little more money. And, uh, they, and then the they start bringing things in from China or wherever else, and you start shopping or the Italian stuff, and people... It, it's interesting, we actually have records of like everything a man owned, which is like a list like this, but it's way better than two tunics, you know, and it's uh, so um, the empire of things. Um, today, though, we live in a world, and this is, as I say, we stare into our closet and the mood is one of coldness of heart, which we experience as boredom. Today we live in a world that some have described as disenchanted. Uh, I don't know if you're a podcast listener out there, 
Uh, uh, any of you are, are fans of uh, uh, Jonathan Pajot? He's done a lot of stuff about enchantment, disenchantment. Uh, they didn't invent it. I, probably one of the first writers to talk about the disenchantment of the modern world was Max Weber, 19th century uh, thinker, sociologist, kind of psychologist type guy. Um, that is sort of noticing that the world we live in um, is, I mean, it's not magical anymore. Right? I mean, I think the first time I read, I, I got bored. <laughs> I was sick, home from school, and a, an aunt of mine had given me, back in, this is in the 60s, had given me The Hobbit and the uh, Lord of the Rings trilogy when nobody in my world had even heard of them. She said, she was a college professor, she said, some of my students think this is good, and she gave it to me for Christmas. But, you know, she's that aunt that gave you books for Christmas, and that had been sitting on my shelf unread, and I had the flu or something, I was just seriously bored uh, and desperate to read something, and so I picked up, found out The Hobbit was the first one, read it, and was toast. I mean, that world of fantasy, it opened a wardrobe door for me. That was a later, later book, but it just was amazing. And in fact, it took me a couple of weeks uh, to get well enough to go back to school. <laughs> As I read all four volumes cover to cover, just soaked it in. And it wasn't till maybe almost college that I met anybody else who had ever read them. So I read them, and it wasn't an internet, you couldn't join a club, there wasn't a movie, you just thought, wow, it was an enchanted world. But there's a difference between an enchanted world and a disenchanted world. Uh, there's a, a, a Canadian philosopher, Charles Taylor, has written a great deal about the modern world. One of his, his best books is called Sources of the Self, The Making of the Modern Identity. I recommend it if you're in grad school and like to read thick philosophical treatises. I don't recommend it otherwise, but it's a very good book. But he illustrates this by noting the difference between this enchanted and disenchanted world. He said the pre-modern person like before modernity, which is sort of starts, let's say around 1700. It was beginning before that, but it cranks up big, late 16, early 1700s. But he said the pre-modern person lived in an enchanted world where meaning was thought to reside in things themselves. The meaning is actually in the thing. Uh, and that the world was full sometimes frighteningly full of meaning. A bone fragment from a saint, he said, retained the sanctity and curative power of the saint. I'm thinking, yes, Orthodox are pre-modern. Uh, still are. Rogation days, which were big on the Catholic and Anglican calendar, were good days for planting. A procession of the Virgin's image could drive evil spirits away. For things possessed their own meanings and powers, and humans lived alongside those meanings rather than creating them. Uh, an enchanted culture experienced the world as charged, teeming with meaning, full of meaning. And so you had to respect it. Uh, Things, he said, are quite different in the contemporary Western person who lives in a disenchanted world where things only mean what we assign them, or so it's thought. You know, it means something because I gave it meaning. You know, it's a, it's a souvenir, but, you know. Uh, so while a medieval could feel irritated or angry or greedy, just like a modern person, the conditions of belief have changed so substantially between that charged religious world and this disenchanted secular world as to change the meaning of those uh, experiences. If, you were, if one was irritated at the order of the cosmos in 1066, for instance, then you were irritated in a very real sense at an ordering that you believed was chosen by God. You could be angry at God but you believe God had ordered the world. Uh, a postmodern irritation is directed at nothing because it's empty. Just a coldly impersonal set of forces. I've been in a conversation lately on my blog, I mean, probably 
three quarters of the work I do on that is just answering comments and questions from people. And I had something that touched that, that third rail, the problem of evil, like, you know, is the world any good or not? You know, is it just bad? And it depends on the mood you're in, again, as to whether or not you can see any goodness in the world. And certainly there's a litany of things going wrong in the world. And, you know, you can just add them all up and just say the world's bad. But, you know, uh, a, a medieval person in his enchanted world could be angry at God. The modern person just thinks maybe there isn't a God because there is no order and it doesn't make any sense. It's just chaos. You know, and I'm thinking, yes, turn that television off. Um, there's another author, a uh, recent one. I, I highly recommend this old book. Um, it's a book, guy's last name is Snell, S-N-E-L-L. -L. He's not snail, he's snail. I can almost make a distinction there. Um, and this is difficult. I mean, I don't know who gave it the book, the title. The title of the book is Acedia, which is the, in Greek it's Akadia, in Latin it's Acedia. I actually Googled it and asked, how do you translate that word? I've always looked at it and just said, eh, what do you say? But anyway, Acedia, which is usually translated as sloth. But it could also be translated as boredom even. But it's one of the great vices. Uh, the desert fathers would say, they called it the noonday devil. That's what happens to you when you're sitting in your desert cave and it's around noon and you're bored. And you can get really bored in a cave in the desert. And there's nothing going on. And that's when you start, it's, they said, wanting to leave your cave and wander around and talk and gossip with the other hermits. You know, and it's, it just always sounded like a scene out of Monty Python to me, you know, <laughs> discussing, you know, how you decorate your cave. I can remember a little skit on that. But, the, you know, the, this, this boredom, this lassitude, a kind of, oh, God, not again. This is the same old, same old. I said those prayers yesterday, whatever. They called it the noonday devil. Makes you want to wonder. So it, Snell wrote a book called Exedia and Its Discontents, Metaphysical Boredom in an Empire of Desire. Now, that's just the kind of book that leaps off the shelf for me. And you know now what kind of guy I am. You know, metaphysical boredom in an empire of desire. It's a Catholic writer. He, say, he says, modern struggle to find the world beautiful or good or of worth. We struggle to find the world beautiful or good or of worth. And once the world and the things of the world are thought worthless in themselves, they bore us. They become boring. Further, we struggle to find worth in other persons or ourselves. However horrifying, we find this boredom impossible to give up. And this is his brilliant insight. We like the boredom because the meaninglessness of the world allows us to treat it and others and ourselves exactly as we wish. The great thing that we love above all else is freedom. The freedom to be what I want to be, the freedom to think what I want to think. I remember a young couple was joining, it was an Episcopal church, I was running them through their inquirers classes, and, and I had a section teaching, trying to teach morality. <laughs> They've changed the rules there. But anyway, I was trying to teach morality in this class, and this couple says to me, what business is it of the church how we behave? And I thought, well, now that's actually a really good question. Um, but I had spent some time studying under Stanley Hauerwas at Duke, and so I was prepared with a pithy answer. And I said, it's very simple. You're raising my children. And if you're not going to behave, I don't want you in my community. Simple as that. You're raising my children. Are you willing to live in a manner that my children will be morally safe around you, or are you coming to corrupt them? I don't think they'd ever been spoken to like that. Um, I can't remember if they stayed or not. <laughs> but, um, but like it or not, all of us has been born into a disenchanted world. I mean, it's just, that's how it is out there. Even when we pursue the faith and are swimming in its healing waters here in an Orthodox church, the haunting thoughts of modernity's disenchantment tend to stay with us. There's always a nagging doubt. You know, if you don't have doubts, then you probably grew up in a cult. 
And uh, I've tried going through that, but I just, you know, you have your doubts. That's, it's the world we live in. We are in the midst of a great spiritual battle that takes a lot of forms. My experience has been that many people uh, in this battle have been wounded, deeply wounded. And I've come, for instance, to think of disbelief when someone tells me they don't believe in God or if they're struggling to believe in God. I tend to think of that as less a problem of the will, you know, that they've chosen badly. Uh, I tend to think of it, or any lack of, of understanding, I tend to think of it rather as a soul wound, a wound in their soul. You know, that wounded in such a way that it makes belief difficult. You know, people in various, I mean, uh, belief in institutions, all institutions are at an all-time low in our culture. You know, I can't think of an institution that enjoys, you know, even positive numbers. Churches, low numbers, you know, Ireland that used to be fiercely Catholic is barely Christian because the institution failed them. And, you know, and it's, you know, in some really nasty ways that got a lot of headlines, you know, played out. Uh, and, of course, there's others out there just quick to jump on the bandwagon and attack Christians and forget all, anything that's gone on that was good and just attack the bad. Uh, but these are soul wounds uh, that oftentimes have to be healed. I find that when we have uh, catechumens uh, coming into the church, that depending on their background and experience, there's oftentimes a lot of things that have to be healed on the road. I can, any number of times I've told Calvinists, you might need to become an atheist before you can become orthodox because you need to not believe in the God you were raised with because that ain't him. You know, it's, it's this punishing God and all that sort of scary imagery, that's not who God is. And uh, even when you can hear the fathers talk like that, you, you should not hear them through a Calvinist, the Southern Calvinist uh, filter. Uh, it's something very different. But anyway, uh, the church is a hospital, a hospital for souls. So I, I, I pray that we can do some um, healing together today, my soul, your soul, uh, and, and try to practice some good medicine. The, uh, I got a quick uh, enchantment story that ultimately connects to Appalachia, where we are. Um, how many of you are born around here? Okay, well, I like that. Lots of natives. That's good. You'll probably understand some of this. In the 1750s, uh, England finally, uh, Protestant England finally decided to adopt the new calendar. It had been on the old calendar. Uh, the new calendar was a papist instrument invented by the uh, Pope back in the 1500s or so. And so the Protestants didn't adopt it. Finally, in the 1750s, they agreed the astronomy was correct. And so they adopted it. And so America and the colonies, they adopted it as well. But it's just in the 1750s, that recent. Here's an interesting story from England, though. Uh, despite the fact that it had had tons of Protestant propaganda for ever since Elizabeth I and you know, trying to wipe away any vestigial Catholicism, uh, there had been the long story back to the Middle Ages of a bush uh, at Glastonbury uh, where the ruins are. Some thought it was the ruins of, you know, King Arthur's kingdom or whatever and all that. So, uh, but this thorn, uh, it was a thorn bush, was, it had a roses or whatever, uh, was believed to bloom every year at Christmas. And apparently it did. It was considered a Christmas miracle. And so the first year of the new calendar, there were people from surrounding counties who made a pilgrimage to Glastonbury on New Christmas, December 25th. Lo and behold, it did not bloom. Ha ha. They came back on old Christmas, January 6th, 7th, whatever it was that year. And uh, it did bloom. And they said, aha, old calendar Anglicans. Old calendar Anglicans, uh, it, it, it eventually disappeared, but it, their sense that the bush knows when it's Christmas. You see, N not a sense of, well, of course it's going to bloom at the same time as last year because of, oh, the climate, the sun, the whatever else. No, the bush knows it's Christmas. The question is, the government has changed the calendar, but what does the bush say? That 
is enchanted thinking. Uh, this is what I call in my first book a one-story universe where God is here everywhere present and filling all things and even a rose bush in Glastonbury knows it. So, and of course, here in Appalachia, which tells you that it goes back before the 1750s, there's a remembrance of, they call it Old Christmas. Because on Old Christmas at midnight, the animals in the barn talk. Did you know that? Have you ever stayed up and gone out there? No, but that's an old, it's an old Appalachian kind of folk tale. And it's just a memory of the enchanted world of the old calendar uh, that continued on. And so the animals talk. I don't know what they say, you know, thinking like, gosh, is it Christmas? I, mean, I don't know what they say. But there they are, enchanted animals, even in our modernistic America, there were vestiges of it that came over. The Puritans up in New England, they knew none of this stuff. They were, they wiped it out, little modernists. Um, Father Alexander Schmemann, and I have to say, I think of my first book as just me doing riffs on Schmemann. Uh, his wonderful little book, For the Life of the World, uh, talks uh, about a lot of things, but especially the center of a, explaining a sacramental world. Like my, my book came out of uh, really trying to teach in, uh, I, I, catechumens how to understand an orthodox view, sacramental view of the world, and I came up with that image of a two-story universe. In the two-story universe, God's up there. I believe in Him, but He's up yonder. But down here, not so much, unless I think about Him. But down here, everything just operates according to its own rules and stuff like that. And, you know, God, if you believe in that, is up here. Down here is just secular. I mean, so Schmemann described this as the problem of secularism. He said secularism isn't a belief that there is no God, but that he's somewhere else. And down here is only marginally his business. You know, and most people, and uh, even modern Christians, uh, in living in a two-story world, refer to God for moral questions sometimes. And he's, he's sort of become the cosmic moral policeman that you might refer to if you're arguing about abortion or something like that. But as for down here, this is, you know, this is no man's land, place where it's just a free-for-all, it's disenchanted, it's just stuff. And if, particularly if you're a non-sacramental Protestant, it's just stuff. I mean, you know, you can find Protestant websites that go at, to great lengths to explain how nothing happens at communion. Nothing. I mean, it's like the doctrine of the Eucharist is that this does not become the body of Christ. This has not become his blood. At best, this is a memorial. Why? Well, that's just two-story thinking. This is me down here thinking about that up there. That's just, that's modern thinking. It is not a New Testament doctrine. One reason, it couldn't be a New Testament doctrine because they hadn't invented secularism yet. They had not disenchanted the world. You have to disenchant the world before you can get that kind of doctrine of the Eucharist. No one at the time of the New Testament would ever even have dreamed of thinking like that. It just, it's just not possible. It's an out-of-place thought. So when some Baptist runs along and tells you this is what Paul meant, no, he didn't. Certainly not what Jesus said. You know, I mean, like you can get literal about everything until Jesus starts talking about his body and his blood. They don't want that either. You know, and it's so literal. Jesus, in the Greek, he, in John 6, when he talks about eating his flesh, he doesn't just say, eat my flesh. He says, chew it. The Greek is chew. I mean, this is, no wonder he freaked people out. You know, I mean, like, you can kind of spiritualize eating. You can't spiritualize chewing. And uh, it bothers me, because back in Episcopalian, we had the wafers, right? Because we always said there were two miracles at the Eucharist for the uh, Episcopalians. One was to believe the bread truly became his body, but before that, you had to first believe that that was bread. Because <laughs> it didn't seem much like bread. But, you know, you kind of put it in your mouth, and it melts on your tongue, and that's how that was. And I was sort of, kind of had a superstition that I ought not chew him, right? And then, as an Orthodox priest, y'all don't get this because you get it on the spoon, but the priest on the altar, you know, and they, they cut a great big old 
piece of bread, and, and I'm now the second priest at my church, and so the other priest just cuts these great big old things there, and I'm just thinking, well, I'm just going to have to get down the Jesus in the, in the Gospel of John and chew this because it's too big to just melt. It's just... So this is... God became flesh and dwelt among us. He entered into an enchanted world and revealed its enchantment. And I'll talk more about that. But uh, Shememan said about secularism, this belief that God is sort of absent from the day-to-day -day world, he actually said that this was the greatest heresy of our time. I mean, not all the things you can, other things you can think about that might bother you. He said this idea of the kind of desacralization of the world was the greatest heresy of our time. Um, the longer I've thought about that, you know, I mean, because sometimes, I mean, the first time I thought about that, I was thinking about sacraments. Okay, so they don't much believe in sacraments, and that's the greatest heresy. Uh, I've come to see now that how much it permeates everything, because to live in a secularized world is to live in a disenchanted world. And in a disenchanted world, it becomes increasingly impossible to believe in truth, beauty, and goodness. Uh, at best, in a disenchanted world, you believe, as they say, the moderns, beauty's in the eye of the beholder, meaning it's beautiful if you think it is. So that actually, when you say something is beautiful, I think you're just, if I'm a modern, I just think you're telling me about you that you think it's beautiful. You don't think the thing has beauty in itself. It's, you know, and what happens when my mood changes and I go and look at it and tomorrow it's not beautiful? Well, the beauty's not in it. The beauty was only in my head and now I'm bored with it, so I'll just throw it away and go buy something else. My wife and we were in, in uh, Tarpon Springs, Florida, the, the summer I was speaking to a, uh, just a huge number of Greeks. And uh, Father was there. We had token non-Greeks. But anyway, uh, we rented a car. And, and it, we don't do that very much. My wife's with me. We rented this car. And we're driving. And my wife liked the car. And she said, we ought to buy one of these. And I, I, I wanted to tell her, sweetie, you ought not say things like that. That's like a wife telling a man that you want to make a baby. <laughs> You're always in favor of it. Uh, sure, darling. Uh, so she tells me that we want to buy a car. And I just, I've, had, I've been fighting new car fever ever since. It's like, this is like, this is like saying sick them to a dog. I mean, you, you know, say, that thing, is, it took me a while. I spent $1,000 fixing up my own car so I would like it better. Uh, just trying to get over the fever. I'm retired. I don't need to drop that much money on a car anymore. But, uh, you know, you, you get bored with the one. Suddenly, the one you have doesn't look as good. It doesn't have, you know, a computer on the dashboard. You know, it doesn't have blinking lights and warning things and all kinds of it was buzz, bells and whistles. It was so much fun. You know, phew. Don't say that. Um, so, this is the great heresy of our time. This disenchantment. This loss of meaning in the world itself. I will begin to shift a little here and I'll ask a question. What do you want? Now that's again, can sound in our modern world like a shopping question. What do you want? Uh, I've got two daughters, I've got three daughters, but the two oldest ones, remember when they were young, sitting in front of a television and on a Saturday morning watching cartoons. This tells you everything you need to know about these two girls. Uh, the oldest one, Mary, was born to be an ascetic, you know, to fast, whatever. We're, the two of them are sitting in front of the television and it's cartoons. And there's a commercial playing, attractive toys and stuff like that, and they're glued to the set. And I stepped up behind them and quietly said, all they want is your money. My oldest daughter went, ooh. It was like, I had just revealed these people to be evil. She went, ooh. My second daughter said, 
how much? <laughs> oh, and she's the priest wife. Uh, and I tell Father Philip Rogers out of Memphis, their husband, I tell him, you know, how is Princess Catherine doing? So, <laughs> uh, oh yeah, you take care of her. You take her shopping. But um, we have these shopping questions hardwired into us. How much? What do you want? What's the desire of your heart? And this is fundamental. And at first take, when I ask the question, what do you want? What's the desire of your heart? We start thinking and reacting about all the variety of possibilities. Do I want happiness? Do I want wealth? Do I want a good reputation, a good family life? But all of those answers are actually wrong. That's not what you want. I'm going to tell you what you want this morning. What we want, the desire of our heart, is God himself. It's what you want. It's what you were created for. You were created for God. Uh, that we don't know that is part of our disenchantment. We've been alienated not only from the meaning, the true meaning inherent in all the things of the world, we've actually been alienated from ourselves. I mean, all you've got to do is read the news uh, and keep up with things to realize that we don't even know what it is to be a human being. Someone made a, a video last year or whatever on the question, what is a woman? Well, he could have started and said, what's a human being? We don't know that. You've got people trying to change their gender. We've got people trying to become dogs. And, uh, you know, that's interesting. Uh, but it, 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 it's interesting because it points to a really, really deep problem not just in the individual, but because nobody around the individual was laughing. Uh, much less, you know, telling them you can't have that surgery to look like a dog. Um, and for some people that would be an improvement, but, um, you know, depending. So, anyway, um, that's not fair or kind. What does it mean to be a human being? What does that mean? To be a human being is, is not something you get to make up. It has a givenness about it. Just like, what does it mean to be a tree? The tree, a tree, God bless the trees, they know who they are. They know what they are. I actually uh, suggest spending lots of time with dogs. I like dogs a lot. Uh, I enjoy spending time with dogs partly because, I mean, first off, they don't sin. You didn't know that, did you? They don't sin. They, they are, like all creation, Paul says, made subject to futility, but nowhere is wrong to actually say that creation is fallen. It didn't do anything wrong. It's made subject to futility, meaning it dies and rots. But dogs are always dogs. A dog has a dog nature. And dogs always act like a dog. They, have, they act in accordance with their nature. Now, a dog nature is pretty similar to a wolf nature. And sometimes if someone says, what do you mean it's not falling? It bit me. And I'm thinking, dude, it's a dog. <laughs> you know, you scared it, it bit you. That's just a dog being a dog. But I, I mean, I like hanging out with dogs because part of a dog nature is they like you. They, they just, they really like human beings. Uh, they even have done studies to show that they can read your emotions. And that's pretty cool. It's better than what a lot of human beings can do. Um, so I like hanging out with dogs. I like hanging out with trees. They don't talk so much. Um, but, uh, I mean, uh, J.R.R. Tolkien uh, was very keen on being a tree friend. And so I take my morning walk each day out in the Arboretum in Oak Ridge, and there's a lot of trees there, and I pay attention to them. And it's great as you do that day after day, season after season, year after year. It, they don't change much because they, they're slow. Uh, we've learned in the past few science years that trees actually talk to each other. They use chemicals to do it, but they talk. And, and surprisingly enough, they speak slowly, like an ant. They speak, uh, Tolkien's intuition about that, uh, that their speech would be slow. I mean, if you're visiting with a tree that's been around for a couple hundred years, they're not in a hurry. You know, they're expecting to be there for three or four hundred more. And uh, it's, it's not bad to sort of pay attention to other beings around you who have done this for a couple hundred years. You might be less anxious if you realize that, you know, trees have done it, you'll make it. You just hang out with them a little bit. I like old trees, uh, especially. But 
What is the desire of our heart? The desire of our heart is God himself. And not just that, but uh, this, is, this is parts of orthodox doctrine. Human beings are essentially good. You are good by nature. God creates us and says of creation, it is good. The first time he ever said something is not good, it was when it's about third chapter or so talking about human beings. He sees Adam alone, uh, somewhere in, there, in those first three chapters, that the man needed help. And he says that, oh, this is not good for the man to be alone. So the first no good in creation was human beings alone. And so he takes a rib from Adam's side and fashions Eve. And so now human beings, it's good. Uh, we exist to be male and female. We exist to be in relationship to each other. That doesn't knock anybody who's single or anybody who's celibate. You can't be a single man and have no relationship to women. You can't be a single woman and have no relationship to men. I, I, some sort of movement recently on TikTok uh, saying women don't need men. I'm thinking, well, that's not going to last long. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> it's that one generation will take care of that. Um, and it's also just not true. It can be that, yes, you do need them even if they are annoying. Okay, that's just a matter of training and housebreaking. But uh, anyway, I've been married 48 years. Y'all surely have beat me on that. Coming up on 50. Coming up on 50. God bless you. Um, you learn a lot in 50 years. Um, and uh, no doubt you've learned a lot. Not as much as he No. <laughs> I was going to say, she probably knew it from the beginning. But when I married my wife, she told me that, that God had put us together. And though I was a young Christian, I was kind of radical when it came to freedom. And I did not like the idea that God had chosen us to be together. And I rebelled. I said, marriages uh, might be blessed in heaven, but they're made on earth. That's, boy, that was a two-story uh, kind of explanation. I've never heard it. But the truth was is that I was just too young and stupid to know any better. Uh, everybody who gets married doesn't know what they're doing. You can't know what you're doing because you don't know enough. You, you certainly can't know the person you're marrying because that takes a long time. I mean, now that I've been married 48 years, I look back and in my rear view mirror, I realize she was right, but not, she didn't even then did she realize what, how right it was. That it's taken years for me to realize, I mean, my whole life has unfolded you know, in the shadow and arms of that woman. I am who I am as much, if not more, because of my relationship with her than anything else. I, I met her, I was a Jesus freak living in a commune and she had just started college and everything we've done in our life since, and we've been through, through some spiritual changes, we did them together. I didn't dare make a move in my life, including becoming Orthodox, that she wasn't 110% on board with. Because, I, I, frankly, I would not have trusted myself by myself. I, I just entr I trusted her spiritual judgment that, that much, that if, if she thought this, this is important to me. So it, that's worked well, um, and it's not always that easy for us. But the desire of our heart is God himself. You were created good, uh, and you may feel very alienated from that. I mean, sin... Uh, alienates us from communion with God so that we, we feel out of communion with Him. We become unaware of the communion that is in fact life itself. Uh, but we also become unaware of our true self and the goodness uh, in which we were created. And, and my, the second book I've got over there about face-to-face, -face, uh, Knowing God Beyond Our Shame. I spent about 10 years working on that book and did a lot of personal learning in that uh, through some things like a crisis in my life and other things and coming to realize the power that shame has. Uh, it's the oldest emotion spoken of in Scripture. Uh, this shame has, and it has a way of hiding us, and we can't get to ourselves. So in, in trying to know Jesus, for me to go in to know him in my inmost self, uh, you run into a wall of shame. I can't even see myself because of the shame that's there. And so getting beyond the shame is what I'm writing about 
in that book. It says in John, John says in his first epistle that it does not yet appear. He says we are the children of God, but it doesn't yet appear what we shall be. In other words, you don't know yourself. You don't know who you are. You don't know who you're going to be. Doesn't yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he appears, we will be like him. For we will see him as he is. That is both a statement about the end of all things, but it's actually also a statement about the journey to the end of all things. Our spiritual life consists in, uh, St. Paul will say this in Colossians, that our life is hid with Christ in God. You want to know yourself? That's how you, where do you find yourself? In Christ. Your life is hid with Christ in God. I should be pointing to the heart. Hid with Christ in God. There he is. He's there. He's closer to me than my breath. He loves me in a way that I cannot fathom. He dwells in me. He loves me. He I can't imagine that he delights in me. The God of the universe delights in me. That's weird. You know, but it's true. He delights in me. And if I don't know that about me, then I don't know that about you. And if I don't know that about you, then I'm missing the point. And I discover that I have difficult difficulty loving you because I'm dwelling on all the things that you're not instead of who you are. Jesus would go so far and he, he points out, you know, the poor, the sick, the naked, the prisoner, all of these, you know, kind of lower caste people of his time and his culture, low caste and ours too, but he says, you know, if you do it to them, you've done it unto me. This radical identification of if you want to know Jesus, you know, you'll find him in others. You'll find him there. It is love that reveals him. And so, you know, this is uh, part of this life. What we want, the desire of our heart, is God himself. And if it's true that human beings are essentially good, that we're creating God's image, and that he delights in us, and that we inherently desire God and long for union, communion with him, then our answer is clear. We desire God himself. We desire communion with Christ. You know, when I'm talking with people, wherever, whether I'm online talking with people or in a conversation and someone's dropped by the church or just I've fallen to, I'm the kind of guy that just starts up conversations with strangers because I'm wired that way. It's a little scary. Um, I'm also the kind of guy that strangers start up conversations with too, and that's even more weird. Uh, but if I'm dressed like this, I think I know what they're up to. But um, so, but um, my assumption when I'm talking to anybody is that all this is true. Is that I know the secret of their existence already. They want to know God. They want to know Christ. So in that sense, I, I just already assume they agree with me about that. They just don't know it yet. They just don't know it yet. And that, you know, the, the thing, if I can be of any help to them at all, is to help them discover uh, the truth of who they are. You know, but that's a whole lot different than arguing with somebody. We, we tend in our modern disenchanted culture to want to argue with people because we think everything is about what you think, not what you are, but what you think. And if I argue with you, you know, then, you know, that I can talk you into some position and you become, you become orthodox, you know. And I, I was invited uh, by the uh, Romanian bishop in Detroit a few years back uh, to a conference. There was like a, three or four of us who were uh, former Episcopal priests who become Orthodox. And it was a whole group of Anglicans, both uh, American Episcopalians and Canadian Anglicans, who were clergy who were interested in becoming Orthodox. And he had invited them there, and we were the show and tell to kind of tell our stories and talk about how you make that journey. And somehow or another, they put me in the, hit, in the, in the cleanup position, you know, batting last. And so all the other guys had gone first, and they're telling their stories, their conversion stories. And after a while, it was beginning to get boring because they all sounded the same, you know, da-da-da-da-da, you know. Then I found orthodoxy, and everything was wonderful, da-da-da-da-da, you know. And I thought, I have got to say something different because that's who I am. And uh, so I told them, I said, you all probably won't, 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 uh, didn't know this. I said, but I was born orthodox. And they're all, you know, I thought he was a Baptist. Now, I was born Orthodox, 
but I lived in schism from myself for 45 years. <laughs> uh, and uh, that's a much better way to think about it. The first thing I say to people when, I've, uh, when we make a catechumen, when I had that job at church of making catechumens, my first words to them afterwards were, welcome home. Welcome home. It, this is not becoming anything that you're not. This is becoming who you are. You know, I mean, the surprise is, is that, you know, Jesus founded a church and this is it. Uh, that's kind of a surprise. Here it is, you know, I kind of point out, you know, like people, like, like they'll say things, well, why do we kiss icons? I said, that's because Jesus started the church with Greeks and Jews, <laughs> which is not something I would have done, but uh, he starts the church with Greeks and Jews, and Greeks and Jews kiss everything. That's just who they are. They also argue a lot, God bless them. And read the book of Acts. First argument in the church, who is it? Greeks and Jews. What's it about? Greek and Jewish issues. That's where they were. That's how the church started. But I point out to them that had Christ instead been born in England, we would still have icons, but instead of kissing them, we would simply feel awkward and apologize. Uh, <laughs> Because that's the English way. If you've ever apologized to a piece of furniture, you might be English. So that's just, oh, excuse me. You know? <laughs> so I say, oh, you're an icon. Woo! And uh, so I just tell people, when you come in and you feel awkward and you don't know how to greet the icons, you're just sharing your ethnic identity with me. I did not realize how English I was until I started hanging out with non-English people. As an Episcopalian, you just think you have good taste, which is simply how the English feel about everybody else in the world, is that they alone have good taste, everybody else is tacky. You know, like Frenchmen and Scots and the Irish, they're all just tacky. Uh, but no, that's just an English sentiment. Um, the, uh, so we learn in orthodoxy, it helps cure you of, of this to a degree. Um, I made one year, we had, uh, I told some of our East Europeans at St. Anne, I said, you know, we have feast days at the church, and later that afternoon, you guys are posting videos on Facebook of like, you're roasting a lamb and dancing. You know, and I said, this is not fair. I'm English, and we have no fun. <laughs> So one year at the beginning of Sunday school season, I said, we're not starting Sunday school until you guys teach us how to dance. And so that first Sunday after coffee hour, we cleared everything out and we had a Moldovan, Moldovan couple that were just wonderful dancers teaching the rest of us how to dance. Because I said, I don't want a Pascha to come around again where we don't dance, English or not. And so it was great. We had fun, um, you know. People had fun who hadn't had fun in years. It was amazing, you know, but anyway, um, there's strange things about our culture. That's what the Reformation did to our people. They took away our dances and, and most of our fun and our sacraments and so, many, so much else. The, um, the desire of our heart is this desire for God. Um, it's the most fundamental aspect of our being. The, writer of the psalm says, Whom have I in heaven but you? And there's none upon earth that I desire besides you. My flesh and my heart fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. The writer of the psalms knows what the desire of his heart is. He just desires God. If you don't have God, then other things start to lose uh, their meaning. The world begins to become disenchanted and boring. Um, and you feel like you're talking to a teenager. You know, this is a terrible thing. Our teens grow up in a disenchanted world. How tragic, how tragic. Because they're desperate, it's a time of life when you're desperately seeking meaning. I think what a great gift my aunt gave me to have introduced me to hobbits when I was a teenager. At least in my imagination, I thought, what if the world were like that? And, and then I later, you know, Jesus Freak later read the Chronicles of Narnia. And there it was, again, this baptism of the imagination. And when I was in seminary, I got serious about it and started reading books on Lewis and Tolkien and discovering that, that those children's books that they wrote were also reflective of a much deeper aspect of their life. 
uh, Lewis as an Anglican and Tolkien as a devout Catholic, but both of them highly sacramental. Not only highly sacramental, but both of them writing in various essays and private letters about this sacramental worldview and the fact that we were living in a disenchanted world, much like G.K. Chesterton did a generation before them uh, in writing about the dangers of this disenchanted world that is, you know, and they had no idea. Schmemann had no idea. We're, I mean, we're living in uh, a, a revealing of the consequences of a disenchanted world in spades. I mean, uh, it's just, it's insane. It's not only insane that we have some of the choices that are being presented to children out there, but these empty, meaningless choices, these desperate measures to create your own meaning are being institutionalized and formalized uh, in law uh, and in HR departments and in universities where they can't even figure out that it's wrong to kill a Jew. We've seen in just the news of this last week. You're just so tied up in political correctness that you're just not certain of the right answer and you have to be nuanced. And I'm thinking there's some things that don't need a nuance. Don't kill the Jews. For that matter, don't kill the Palestinians. Don't kill. No nuance, no context. Don't kill. This is, is written in your heart, but if you're estranged from your heart, then you're even estranged from the truth of, of the most basic, simple, simple, primitive morality. You won't know right from wrong. And that is a dangerous world to live in. You know, the, uh, the danger of the Germany of the 1930s when Hitler came to power was in a culture that it had already, if you read a little bit about Weimar Germany, it is already losing touch with itself. Uh, there's a, oh, it's a German-made program on Netflix. I'm trying to think of what it is, but it's set in Berlin. It's ba got Babylon in the title, most fittingly. Uh, and it's set in pre or beginning early German, Nazi Germany, and the emptiness of it. I mean, it's much like our emptiness, uh, all kinds of just sexual experimentation and everything else and stuff's eroding and breaking down. And uh, the result of that is people actually do want order. And the result of it ultimately is fascism of some form or other. Someone will promise order and people can be so desperate for it, they'll give it to them. Whether it's on the left or the right, they want an order, but it, it's dangerous if they don't know what the inherent natural order of things are. Uh, because uh, as G.K. Chesterton said, when a man ceases to believe in God, it's not so much that he believes in nothing as it is he's willing to believe in anything. Boy, there's our world. Um, and interestingly, Chesterton also said, uh, the modern, it's not that the modern world has no virtue, is that in the modern world, the virtues have run rampant. So I was speaking in Seattle a few years ago, and I told him, I said, it's really interesting to be here in the most moral city in America. It's very moral out in Seattle. You've got people in the streets, you know, stopping your car or whatever uh, because you're, I mean, just because you're polluting or something else or you violated some other uh, political agenda and everybody will just tell you there, it's like living in, you know, in Puritan New England, only it's a new Purit uh, Puritanism. Woke is a religious movement because America has been a religious movement since we were founded. Our political parties were both religious movements in their founding. They were not political. That's why, uh, that's why we hate each other so much. These are competing religions. Uh, and they can both be highly irrational because they've both lost their mooring in the truth of Christ. Uh, and they'll neither one do you any good. You know, so uh, there's enough of that. Uh, but let me leap to this quickly. We started a little late, so we'll run a little late. Um, Kierkegaard, the famous Dutch, Dutch, no, Danish philosopher, the Danish philosopher, 
famously said, purity of heart is to will one thing. When I first read that as a teenager, I thought, cool, I'll find something to will and go will it. You know, and that's my purity of heart. Actually, the problem is, is that I read just the quote, which is usually pretty much the entire, you know, I, I gotta remember that as a writer, they're only gonna remember one thing <laughs> that I ever said. So I better find it and say it in a real pithy manner. But Kierkegaard, purity of hearts to will one thing. Jesus said uh, that, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. So it's an interesting quote, purity of heart is to will one thing. But if you actually read Kierkegaard, he defined the one thing. He said the one thing is the good, with a capital G. He's got one letter too many. It's God. The purity of heart is to will one thing. And the one thing is that which he were created for, God himself. To will one thing, to will to know God, is how we move towards uh, unity of heart. Those of us who are suffering from uh, exedia, who are uh, bored or listless, it doesn't mean that we become lazy. I, I read this wonderful comment. This is basically from uh, Evagrius, one of the early <laughs> writers of the church. He said, the slothful are often in a frenzy of action, now this, now that, in their disgust and abhorrence at what God asks of us, we might actually anticipate the slothful individual in culture to be very busy. And as the purposelessness and arbitrary nature of their business is revealed, to be ever more distracted, exhausted, and bitter in the unending attempt to express and display freedom without humility before the yokes of place, limits, and order. I mean, you... It's, it, this listlessness, I mean, this is a description of our modern world. One thing, now the other, now this, now that. Material things, join a gun club, whatever. Go get a, a, an interest sort of thing. Uh, people ask me, uh, what are you doing now that you're retired? And basically the real answer is the same thing I've always been doing. I, when I was four years old, too young to read, walking down a railroad track with my older brother who was nine or ten at the time, walking down the tracks, because uh, that's how mom and dad sent us to church. It was about a mile down these railroad tracks and they'd kick us out on Sundays and we'd go. And he said, I was carrying my Bible, the little Bible that my mama's Sunday school class had gifted me when I was born, but it's my Bible. And if any of you grew up Baptist when we went to Sunday school, they had a card and they would check, did you bring your Bible? So I was four years old, couldn't read it, but I could get a check mark for bringing it. But I'm walking down the railroad tracks of this, and my older brother, being the way he was, begins to taunt me. And he says, why are you carrying that Bible you can't read? <laughs> and he said, I said to him, it doesn't matter, it's the Word of God. <laughs> so I've been preaching since I was four. Uh, and I'm still doing it. Um, including when I'm retired. I've just found other places uh, where I can continue to do it. Jesus says in Luke 6, a good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth that which is good. And an evil man out of the evil treasure of his heart brings forth that which is evil. For of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Coldness of heart, this thing that settles into us, this boredom, this alienation from ourselves and from things around us uh, creates a sort of breeding ground uh, for evil. Uh, if there are temptations you wrestle with, you will, if you fall into that state of boredom, you will be uh, particularly vulnerable to those temptations in that state. Um, what is needed in our lives uh, is in fact purity of heart, the recovering uh, the wonder of God, our delight in God, uh, our uh, union with God. And I might add to that, as we discover God, uh, that we also begin to discover the delight of the world around us. Um, you know, one of the things we've lost to a degree, and we're heading towards Christmas, so I'll mention it in this as I'm going to try to wrap us up a little bit here. We've lost the wonder 
of a feast and of celebration. Uh, it's still, the culture has some memory of it attached to Christmas. They don't do it exactly well, uh, but it is interesting that they do it. I mean, it's, I say it's not done well because we overshop. Uh, gift giving is not a bad thing, it's a good thing. We overshop, we under donate, we don't do enough charity. You know, if you read Dickens and discover uh, that uh, uh, Ebenezer Scrooge, after his conversion, always kept Christmas well. Said, and how did he keep Christmas well? With this generosity he had learned and, and, and understood what it was that the business. Uh, the welfare of humanity was my business, he learns. That's my business. And so to be about that, uh, you know, it's odd uh, that we have to spend time talking about the environment and climate uh, and that we've given that up to, to sometimes to crazies to talk about it. Why? Because we forgot. We forgot to celebrate creation. We forgot to celebrate a river and we treated it like a thing. You don't put poison in your thing. Even a dog knows not to dump in his own space. But we're dumb that way. We've, we've poisoned uh, the very places we have to drink. I, I live in Oak Ridge, Tennessee. Many of you know what Oak Ridge is associated with. We uh, built the first atom bomb. And we still take care of your nuclear weapons because someone has to know whether to cut the red or blue wire. And uh, so we still do that there. Um, but I was talking to some of the city fathers a few years back and they were looking for a new motto for the city of Oak Ridge. The present motto says Oak Ridge, the dream, no, the vision lives on. And I think that's kind of scary, dudes. <laughs> Build it bigger. <laughs> we'll blow the whole world, why not? So anyway, the vision lives on. And I had some suggestions. One of those was a motto uh, that would be Latin and classy, which would be uh, quid parum plutonium inter amicos, which is what's a little plutonium among friends? And uh, <laughs> they didn't think that one was any good. And I thought, well, let's have something that's more local and, and to the point, because uh, they were always complaining about how many people work in Oak Ridge but live in West Knoxville. So I said, we need a new motto that says Oak Ridge, upstream, upwind. <laughs> like, you fools, you're living downstream from this place, what's wrong with you? You know, y'all have your own stories of King of Eastman uh, chemicals up this way. I mean, we do these things, we poison ourselves. You know, we've invented all kinds of, of medical conditions that are clearly related to a poisoned food system. And I'm not a lefty, I'm just telling you, we eat a lot of poison. My oldest daughter lived a year in Siberia, in Russia, in 2000, a whole year. And uh, she had food allergies, just terrible food allergies here. We were thinking, oh my goodness, how is she going to survive in Siberia? Well, she goes to Siberia and the Russian food chain is just not very good in terms of distribution. You know, leftover from communism, they hadn't learned to do it, so mostly they grew stuff in Krasnoyarsk outside and they pickled it with brine. In the winter, you ate what you grew and stuff like that. My daughter reported she had no allergy problems over there. She came back having gained some pounds with roses in her cheek. And I thought, who knew? You just needed more time in Siberia. So uh, mind your P's and Q's. But uh, we poison ourselves. And we're doing it to it. And we just pay a lot of money on the medicine stuff to try to figure out what it is we've done. We've forgotten who we are. So, you know, if you're struggling in your prayers, if you're struggling in church and you feel coldness of heart and alienated from God, uh, understand you're also alienated from yourself. This is a kind of a global problem. How do you, you know, what do you do? Part of it, work at returning to wonder. Um, wonder in the smallest things. Uh, I love spending time, I've got a, right now a three-year-old grandson in Oak Ridge, uh, red-haired little boy, cute as a button, and uh, his mother was shopping in Food City the other day, and somehow or another he picked us up, he's riding in the food, in the shopping cart, and as they're going up and down the aisles, and he was saying, I throw up on all of you, I throw up on all of you, <laughs> but we don't know where he picked that up but he had everybody's attention in the store. <laughs> uh, but spending time with him, I rec highly recommend spending time with young children, taking him for a walk in the Arboretum, they look at details. 
a bug can be just the whole day. Just how wonderful is a bug? You know, how wonderful is this bush? How wonderful is this tree? How wonderful is this rock? What is this? And, you know, and how many times do I walk through the arboretum and all I see is the inside of my head? Just in my thoughts. And I've been working really hard when I'm there to look at things. I put a picture of a rock I found in a path recently on my Facebook page asking others. It had these lines in it. And I thought, was this, where's this from? It was the question, is this, you know, prehistoric or, or post-historic? What is this thing? And I got a lot of answers. I should have asked somebody in Oak Ridge. They know everything. But, I mean, to me, I go, I, I go, I go visit that rock every time I go because it's still interesting to me. I don't have an answer to the question. But it's like, I don't walk past the rock without noticing the rock. And it actually makes a difference in how you walk, to notice the rock, to notice the tree, to notice the child. You know, they, as annoying as they can be, they are unbelievable sources of wonder. Unbelievable sources of wonder. Jesus says you must become as a little child to enter the kingdom of God. You know, so we begin to recover some childlike wonder, uh, to enter the service and be amazed at it. It's always this problem as a priest. You begin to get so accustomed to being in the altar that, I mean, you're standing in this, the Holy of Holies in the presence of God and your mind's wandering. <laughs> and your mind's wandering. I mean, I have ADD. My mind always wanders. But, you know, nonetheless, I mean, it's like, what does he have to do? You know, it's like, I, I work at it. I work at it. We, these things, you know, pay attention to. But so if I have a message in this first talk, it is about this coldness of heart to say it's a much larger problem than you think. It's not a psychological issue. It's bigger than that. You're, 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 there's nothing. Your psychology is working the way it works because of what kind of culture you live in. You live in a secularized culture in which you've been taught that the world is actually inherently boring and meaningless. And yet, and so you discover you have coldness of heart. That's right. But you've walked through the doors and here you are in Narnia. You've walked through the doors and here you are in Middle Earth. You've walked through the doors and here you are as we teach in the church authoritatively. This is the kingdom of God. Blessed is the kingdom, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Here you are. All things are possible here. Here it's possible to discover uh, the goodness of all things. And so we take bread, wine, oil, water, just things out of the world and they become the gate of heaven. The very moment I eat the body, I chew the body of God. How cool is that? How cool is that? How can someone be bored who regularly choose the body of God. What kind of insanity have we come into? And I say this too, and I'll say this as well to my older friends. I see a few of us here, those of us who've earned our gray hair or lost our gray hair, depending. <laughs> so, I mean, you, are you discovering the wonder or have you lived too long? Imagine that you've lived too long. It's just the wonder of it. I was, my daughter, my baby daughter got married uh, in October and I was out in Memphis for the wedding. And so there was a mix of my family, a lot of orthodoxy type folks, and the groom's family who were kind of secularized. And, uh, and I was just amazed because all of my children were there and it was all that was just sort of great. It was wonderful. And I said, made the comment at the rehearsal, I mean at the after party, after the wedding, I said, you know, I probably won't see all these people together again until I'm laying flat. And they immediately said, oh, don't say that. And I thought, you know, I'm a Christian. I'm really looking forward to it. You know, uh, I mean, and I'm old. I've already, I, I passed 70, which means my, my warranty's expired. And, uh, I'm just moving on along to, the, to these bad years the Bible promised me until I'm, I'm dead and then we can all get together again. One of us has got to do it and I'd rather it be me than them. 
So, you know, uh, there it is. But it, it, I realize then I'm talking to secular people who think the worst thing that can happen to you is dying. Um, you, you have these Medicare uh, interviews when you uh, reach a certain age, and that includes having to find out, you know, if you're crazy or not. And uh, so I was sitting with this psychologist who was asking me these questions, and she asked, have you ever thought you would be better off dead? And I said to her, well, I sure hope so. <laughs> and I actually have to tell you, I said it a little more saucy than that, but I, I'm in church and I dare not tell you how exactly I said it, but I sure hope so. She looked at me very funny. I said, ma'am, I'm a Christian. Uh, and if I'm not going to be better off dead, then I have wasted my life. But uh, yes, yes, I, have, I, I try to remember that I'm going to be better off dead. Uh, and I try to pay attention to the account I've got to give for how I lived. And I, so pay attention to your heart. Pay attention to the coldness. And by paying attention, literally, how do you heal it? Pay attention to the good, to the beautiful, to the true. In the face of those things, I mean, something to repent of. God, I walked through your world and I ignored it. God, I walked through your world and I thought my anxiety was more important than a tree. You know, pay attention. Uh, beauty, truth, and goodness are around us everywhere, including in your deepest heart. God give us grace to know that, to see that, to celebrate it, and to give thanks always and for all things, as Paul said. Thank you. Good. That's the first talk. Yay! A little Q&A. Yes, we can do that. Sure. I'll try to keep the answers short. This is where my ADD gets me in trouble. You ask me a question, I'll tell you everything I know. <laughs> hmm. Yes? This is not the question I was planning to ask. I've been thinking three weeks about what I was going to ask. This is, but your topic brought up something else. I feel like I'm a Christian today because my grandfather was born in 18 First off, um, always a difficulty about raising children is that uh, the culture is raising them more than you are. You know, uh, they are baptized in the culture, and we have them drawing colored pictures in Sunday school for an hour or 15 minutes. And you know, and so this is. Do you have a garden? I, I don't. We, we, my, my wife and I just bought a home in July. Plan to have one. Good. Grow a garden. It, it, there's, there's, um, yes, I, I understand what you're saying, and in a way, we, we have become alienated uh, as, you know, I, here's something that you might not have thought of. Uh, I, I was talking to some guy who was a like, computer program the other day, and he was feeling just so estranged because he sits in front of his computer and he's doing his job, and it just feels alien to nature. Uh, I remembered seeing a book of prayers, a medieval book of prayers, and one of the prayers in it began A, B, C, D, E, and it was the whole alphabet, and the end there's a thing in which the monk writing this thanks God for the letters of the alphabet, because without them we couldn't write the book and do our prayers, yada, yada, yada. You know, in uh, Russia, at least uh, even under the communists, they had a hol annual holiday called Alphabet Day. That actually was the feast of St. Cyril and Methodius who gave them the alphabet to write, you know, uh, the Cyrillic characters and, you know, to write down uh, Russian language. But even the communists thought it was good to have a thanks for uh, the alphabet. I mean, those of you working with computers, have you ever bothered to give God thanks for numbers? Even if it's only one and O? Oh? 
um, to give God thanks for numbers by which you do your job, by, I mean, to actually feel wonder at what you're doing. I remember the day my children were gathered around me and I bought my first computer that could connect to this new thing called the internet. They were standing around me in my bedroom where I had it set up on a little table and desk and we plugged it in. You know, and I'm looking and thinking about movies, you know, things I've seen and, and I'm trying to get online. CompuServe or something like that, and suddenly, you know, that whole kind of telephone hookup thing like that, and suddenly I'm there, and I said, I'm in. I mean, it's like, it's like, I, was, like I was hacking my way into the universe, and the girls are standing around me going, ooh, and when, of course I'm thinking, ooh, look at the demons. No, I mean, sorry. <laughs> but, I mean, that day we stood and looked at the internet with wonder. You know, I've got more power than that in my pocket right now. You know, and all of this stuff. Beth and I driving along, we take these trips, and a question will come up, like, we're driving through West Tennessee, and they've got cotton fields. And I'm thinking, have those fields been picked? Is there that much cotton left in a field that's been picked? And we're both talking and wondering, and suddenly dawns on us, darling, you have a computer in your head. Would you mind Googling it? And, you know, but actually, I learned some things about cotton while we were traveling along. If my mom and dad had been in the car, they could have answered it for me, but now they've, they've died and gone on to Google. And uh, so, <laughs> must be where they are. But uh, they've been uploaded. So, <laughs> but, uh, I mean, to live a life of wonder. Um, so, if I was talking on shame, which I'm not, uh, I would tell you that a healthy shame is necessary for the sense of wonder. The healthy shame that there's something bigger than you that is just awesome, wonderful, is actually necessary for worship. Uh, Isaiah chapter 6, he sees God high and lifted up. His train fills the temple and the angels are saying, holy, holy, holy. This vision that we repeat every Sunday in the liturgy. And what is Isaiah's response to it? Woe is me, for I'm a sinful man. You know, it's not like he's just standing there sinning. It just, woe is me, I am a sinful man. And I live in the midst of a sinful people. And an angel comes down and touches his lips with a coal. And so we'll say, you know, after communion, this coal of fire has touched your lips and taken away your iniquities, cleansed you from all your sins. We repeat this, but his experience is actually healthy shame. It's how you ought to feel in the presence of the holy of holies and the angels. You, you ought to feel that. It's not, you know, it's like I, I feel that and I hate myself. It's I feel that and it's wonderful. And I see that in the face of the wonderful, I'm so... I see the truth of myself. I see God, and you can't see God without seeing you. It's a package deal. And so, you know, I encourage you towards wonder. And if that means bearing a little shame, it's good. It's good. You should feel, you come into church, it's like, whoa, whoa. <laughs> but anyway, let's, are we done a little bit? We can save up for the next Q&A. Yes. Sir. Okay. Uh, Let's have a prayer. I, want, I feel like praying for a minute. You know, and y'all can stand and we'll talk to God. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Oh, Christ God, soften our hearts, warm our hearts, that we might see you, that we might wonder at your creation, that we might wonder at your hand in all things, working all things together for good. Uh, forgive us for overlooking you for overlooking the world or living only in our own heads and have mercy on us. For to you we give glory, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit now and ever and unto ages of ages. Amen. Amen. Very good. So.